regulators and policy makers. So that there will be a brief um, account of the Ford Model T, a vehicle that we will be widely talking about today, and then there will be a viewing of the video. So after the video, we will make the link from um, Ford Model T to the theory of innovation, and then last but not least, there will be a conclusion and then a Q&A. So an example of this would be the vacuum cleaner. Prior to the James Deason vacuum cleaner, most of the vacuum cleaners required a dust bag. But <clears throat> any um, any innovation with, um, in this market will be an incremental innovation as they mostly make um, changes and improvement, improvements upon the components itself. But with Deason's vacuum cleaner, they didn't require a dust bag. So this, uh, this represented a radical innovation as it paved the way for the introduction of this new innovation which is the, the vacuum cleaners not needing a dust bag. So this theory helps us understand also why new firms would be unwilling to take in new technology, to accept new technology and these factors include traditions, some costs and uh, commitment, to, uh, internal political constraints. So for traditions, if a working practice has been widely accepted and deeply ingrained in the company, in an organization. Um, a few people will question the rationale behind such uh, working practices, and it becomes um, deeply ingrained in the organization. And because of these traditions, will be hard to break. And for some costs, um, some costs are cost associated associated with prior investment, and if a uh, Cost is technology specific, it is, it is a sound cost and it will be hard to transfer such cost to another technology. And firms will be looking to spread this spread this cost over future output, which is why they sometimes would not be uh, will not welcome new technology. And as for political constraint, if a ma if managers have a strong commitment to uh, a no technology that they are very familiar with, they will not welcome a new technology that they hardly, they know little about. And because of their position, they, they, may, they might even stop other people from doing so. And with this, I will pass my time on now to Nia, who will talk to you about the technology as well. Thank you, Sunny. <coughs> uh, now I'll talk about the theory of technology as uh, the central idea behind the theory of technology as comes is the notion of uh, technology life cycle. This implies that the capability <coughs> of uh, technology to deliver improved performance will vary over time. Uh, as you can see in the graph uh, in the early stage, um, uh, technology will uh, uh, technology form uh, in investment of engineering of effort of technology. Additional effort <coughs> um, produce ever greater um, improvement. This learning curve effect, uh, eventually, this effect will begin to lessen until it reaches a point where um, increasing effort produce diminishing returns in terms of um, performance improvement. Uh, this is uh, a natural limit of uh, technology, and it happens when uh, technology uh, mature. So why does a technology mature? Uh, that's because of its physical limit. Uh, giving an example of uh, sailing ship technology, uh, we can see that um, the speed of the sailing ship technology was limited by the physics of wind and water. In the 19th century, the T rippers uh, represent the uh, high power of sailing ship technology. Uh, however, it later uh, was increased by the steamship uh, which substitute the uh, uh, steam power for wind. Uh, technological maturity is also uh, a matter of scale and complexity. Scale is a matter of a technology um, to get impossibly less uh, in the pursuit of improved performance, while complexity is a matter of there being more and more components. Uh, as technology mature, it requires uh, radical innovation associated with uh, new technology. Uh, in general, the theory of technology as uh represents uh, what happened in real life and predicts the long-term path of innovation. So uh, it has both the uh, predictive value and also the uh, descriptive value. Uh, now I hand on my time to talk about the two other things. 
Okay, next I shall be talking on the theory of dominant design, but before that I have a question for the floor. Um, can you name some dominant designs for me? iPod. Uh, Microsoft Excel. Okay. Microsoft, yeah, very good, okay. And so all these designs have something in common and then they have become the industry standard. So now we see the definition. The definition of a dominant design refers to a product or process that has won the allegiance of the marketplace and has become the industry standard. Okay, now we look at the diagram above, okay. There's the, before the dominant design appears, there's always a pre-paradigmatic phase where there are many competitors competing on design, okay? And no one design actually stands out here. So as they enter into the shakeout phase, a dominant design will emerge. From then on, companies will compete based on price, okay, and for product incremental innovation. As the dominant design is out already, there's no longer a need to compete based on design. Okay, so what actually happens in this shakeout phase for a dominant design to emerge? Three things, we have consumer preference, okay? Consumer preference will give a higher market share to products that consumers prefer. For example, of all the MP3s, um, iPod is widely popular, so this gives iPod a higher market share. Next, market power. What do I mean by market power? Market power meaning a big <coughs> company has the ability to cut costs, okay, to drive other competitors out of competition, or to have more advertisement to raise product awareness. Okay. Lastly, government regulation will also be instrumental towards a dominant product appearing. Okay, next. Okay, now we take a look at the theory of absorptive capacity. The theory of absorptive capacity differs from all three other theories because it integrates both the internal and external environment. As we can see from the diagram above, external environment and internal environment are both sources of which we can gain our ideas from. But just having these sources are not enough. We need to be able to absorb. Hence, to have an innovative output at the end, we need to be able to absorb and diffuse it within the various levels of our hierarchy. Okay, so I mentioned about an organization's capacity to learn, and there are three factors that affect it. First, exposure to relevant knowledge. An organization and its staff have to be able to constantly keep abreast of various developments in a field. And to evaluate these new developments would require the presence of prior knowledge. What do I mean by the third point, diversity of experience? Diversity of experience simply means that the greater the range of expertise within the company, the greater the scope for recognizing external environments. Okay? And this theory of absorptive capacity highlights external knowledge as a critical component, which explains why network and networking is so important to us, because it increase, increases the scope in which we can recognize different ideas. One uh, very good example of an innovation that appears of the absorptive capacity would be the high technology swimwear fabric. Okay, this swimwear fabric actually combines swimming material together with the skin of marine animals. Okay, to give you this swimwear fabric which has helped <coughs> swimmers rewrite many records in the 2008 Olympics. This has led to its subsequent ban because organizers believe that swimmers depend more on technology rather than on their own skill. Okay. And for now, I'll pass on the presentation to Brian who will talk more about, about the theories of innovation. Okay, so why are theories of innovation important and what do they mean to would-be innovators? Theories of innovation can help would-be innovators to predict industry change, to determine potential competitors, to understand the difficulties of implementing new innovation in organizations, and to understand the importance of using new external knowledge and applying it internally within the organization. Theories of innovation also offers us three main contributions. They are descriptive, analytical, and predictive elements. Theories provides us with a description of the process of innovation and how the innovation came about. They usually talk about the course of events and how these events were linked with each other. However, merely describing key events is not sufficient. Would-be innovators need to um, understand why certain innovations occurred the way they did, why innovations, why some innovations were successful and why others were not. Hence, this is where the analytical portion comes in. Theories of innovation provides us with analytical tools, tools which help us explain why innovations occur, uh, ex helps us identify common patterns and draw comparisons between innovations. Last of all, theories of innovation gives us that predictive uh, element. Prediction helps us anticipate the next course of events, helps us anticipate the problems and difficulties associated with 
innovation and helps us define the scope for planning in order to use <coughs> resources more effectively. Ultimately, theories of innovation helps us understand the reasons behind why certain innovations were successful and why others were not. Um, now I will hand over the time to Ming to explain to you um, the importance of theories of innovation to policymakers.